Hello everyone and welcome to the Speculative Wildlife Research Center, where we reimagine creatures and monsters from all realms of fiction through the lens of speculative biology. Today we will be looking at mermaids, those famous half-woman, half-fish legendary creatures sighted by sailors all over the world, as well as their masculine counterparts, the mermen. These creatures have been renowned as bringers of disaster or healers and givers of wisdom, and have long fascinated humanity for good and not so great reasons. While nowadays it is commonly accepted that most sightings of these creatures could have been misinterpretations of regular marine creatures, especially seals or manatees, I wanted to go a different route to make these creatures extra special. So thank you everyone who suggested these creatures, and let's get ready to see what they could be like as real living animals. Also, if you are enjoying these videos, please consider supporting the channel by liking and subscribing, or by donating on Ko-fi, link available in the video's description. And, as always, I will be giving some design and biology notes at the end, so please stay if that is something that interests you. Now, without further ado, let's get started. Today we return to the seas, to meet a creature that has terrified and fascinated humanity for as long as we have crossed paths with them. A creature that can be, at a glance, much more beautiful but deeply more unsettling than many sea monsters we have met on the channel. Mermaids. While many times it has been believed, due to their appearance, that mermaids must be somehow related to humanity, something that even became a part of their scientific name, Anthropisis erythropterygium, these majestic creatures are in fact close relatives to the humble mudskippers. As these fish migrated from their habitat in the Indo-Pacific region, they underwent a notable increase in size in order to survive bigger aquatic predators and adapt to the colder water around them, until reaching their modern size of 1.5 to 2 meters or 5 to 6.5 feet long, with some females being reported as reaching even greater sizes. However, in order to still be capable of moving on land, their already heavily developed pectoral fins, as well as the muscles associated with them, have become even stronger, allowing them to easily climb and walk on land, aided by their long, muscular tail and a series of bone spurs growing out of their pectoral fins, which help them hang onto rocks when on land. Their head, in contrast, has become proportionately smaller, as their prey are much smaller in comparison to those hunted by smaller mudskippers. When seen superficially, swimming under the water surface and with their ornaments hidden, it is not strange that many sailors have confused these creatures with seals and manatees, but more than once, their slow swimming has led to them being confused with drowned human beings, leading to many unfortunate sailors to launch into the water to help, only to be immediately attacked by these fish. While mermaids share a wide territory with other individuals of their species, they are not especially sociable, and will constantly make loud calls to delimit their own turf. They will do this through a process called stridulation, the creation of sound by rubbing together specialized body parts. In the case of mermaids, these high-pitched calls will be made by rubbing the pharyngeal teeth and amplified by their swim bladder, creating a sound similar to that of a trumpet or a conch. These calls are great for scaring off or warning competitors to stay away, but it has also given rise to a very interesting phenomenon. When these calls echo and reverberate among the rocky outgrowths where mermaids live, they sometimes end up creating a sound unnervingly similar to beautiful, harmonious singing. These chants have often caused curious sailors to get too close to these rocky beaches causing their ships to crash and capsize, 
leading to mermaids being viewed as the cause of shipwrecks and other disasters. A view not helped by the grim tales of many survivors, that tell of how mermaids immediately disappeared into the water, dragging the bodies of drowning sailors to the depths. In fact, it seems like mermaids living near human populations with lots of fishing and sailing have adapted to this source of food, often calling in unison upon sighting ships. Males of the species are those that have often received the naming of mermaids, the term mermen being given to females due to a confusion by early sailors and naturalists. This confusion arises from males possessing traits that seem traditionally feminine, at least according to the standards of older times. During competition or courting, males will expose and display a series of beautiful ornaments formed from their dorsal and pectoral fins, ranging in color from a pale yellow to a deep red, varying between populations across their living range. Given how important these ornaments are to securing a mate, having replaced the more aggressive and damaging fights of other close species, mermaids will constantly groom their ornaments using the bone growths on their pectoral fins, thus keeping them in optimal condition. This behavior, notably, appears to give it a resemblance to a woman combing her hair, although earlier authors also compared the beauty and size of these ornaments to the spread wings of a bird. In any case, the natural beauty of these animals, despite their not so graceful appearance while unadorned, has led to the creation of an entire industry as boats and ships will approach the rocky beaches where these fish gather for tourists to see. Females of the species, much plainer, unadorned and, to some people, straight up uglier, are also much bigger than males for reasons we will explain in a moment. Once mermaids have mated, males will immediately leave to feed by their lonesome while females will isolate themselves in order to care for their few eggs until their brood is born. This is where their greater size and bulk will serve them, as they will stay near their eggs without ever leaving to feed themselves, and will depend on their reserves until the eggs finally hatch. There they will stay, aggressively fighting off any potential threat to their young. Should any creature be foolish enough to approach the mother mermaid, it will only become sustenance. Once the mermaid larvae are born, the exhausted mother will finally be able to feed, having survived thanks to its reserves. Given the greater size and lifespan of mermaids compared to other fish, their litters have become much smaller. Less than half a dozen mermaid larvae will be born and the mother will carry them in her mouth until they are old enough to survive on their own. Mermaid fry will stay with their mother for protection, as they will not develop their pectoral fins until reaching maturity, and will be exclusively aquatic for the first part of their life, leaving their mother only when they are strong enough to walk on land by themselves. Some mermaids, unfortunately, are born with a peculiar malformation that makes them have two tails. This malformation is very harmful to the mermaid, as it will prevent it from swimming, hunting and escaping from predators. Being unable to survive, the two-tailed baby will be quickly abandoned by the mother. Many two-tailed mermaids have been caught by fishermen. To be raised as pets, or sold as curiosities to be displayed in carnivals. And that's it for speculative biology look into mermaids. Beautiful maidens of the sea, these mermaids are not. As mentioned before, in our video on manticores, it can prove tricky to balance proper animal anatomy with the human features of many mythological creatures and the presence of these features in an animal would most likely make them look very unnerving. 
Now, one thing you might be questioning is the fact that I inverted the biological sex of mermaids and mermen, making the beautiful, fragile mermaids into males and the large, ugly and aggressive mermen into females. I did this because the usual pattern of these creatures is the opposite of what happens on fish. Males tend to be much more colorful and much more adorned in order to attract females. And females are many times bigger, in this case explained by their need to care for their eggs. Regarding the singing of mermaids, another element I took a not so obvious path for, I was inspired by an interesting personal experience. One time, as I was walking across the halls of a building, I heard what sounded like, I kid you not, a celestial choir. As I kept walking, I realized the chorus was coming from downstairs, exactly where I was heading. I walked on, and the majesty of the music only became more and more amazing. But as I started walking down the stairs, the chorus started breaking apart little by little. That's when I realized what I was hearing was echoing, reverberating and becoming amplified by the sturdy concrete walls surrounding the stairs. And the actual source of that beautiful music I was hearing was... A single guy playing two chords over and over on an out-of-tune guitar. I found that to be incredibly weird, just the fact that something like that was possible. And it wasn't long before the idea of beautifully singing mermaids being a similar phenomenon became ingrained in my head. So it's really fun to finally use that idea. All things considered, from the research process and all the way to finalizing the design, this was a very fun episode to work on and I hope you guys enjoyed it as well. And remember, if there's any type of creature you'd like me to give the speculative biology treatment in the show, please sound off in the comments below. Thank you all for watching, and see you next time on the Speculative Wildlife Research Center.